very cool. So the official opening slide would be uh, this one. So this is Drupal 8's multilingual APIs. And I am Gabor Hoichi. I work at Acquia in the office of the CTO under Dries Beithart. And my current role is uh, Drupal 8 initiative coordinator, coordinator. So I'm trying to help all kinds of Drupal 8 initiatives to figure out how to make things happen, how to get people uh, aligned on things, how to celebrate all the work that everyone does, um, and how to figure out what can go into each release and that kind of stuff. Um, and where I started from in terms of Drupal 8 initiatives is the multilingual initiative, uh, of course, you may know. So I've been working for four and a half years to lead the multilingual initiative, mostly as a volunteer and to some degree sponsored by Acquia. And the problem that we started with in Drupal 7 is kind of similar to my experience with the conference badges. So I like to use these conference badges as examples where multilingual in Drupal 7 is kind of an afterthought. So it may or may not work. And then you get things like these when the font will not exactly match, or you get things like these when the printed schedule has like a total different character for your name, or even Twitter would not get it right. So I get this email from Twitter about a month ago with this one. So I think people who, who have these kind of problems understand that when a system is not designed for multilingual friendliness, it may or may not work in certain cases. And that's kind of a problem with Drupal 7. So you can make it do multilingual things, but it does not natively understand that problem. And I worked on leading this initiative in Drupal 8, but I, it wouldn't be possible without all the work that people did. So we also have a list of everyone who worked on the multilingual initiative. This is the first part of the list. And the whole list would be like this. Uh, it's around 1,300 people who worked on Drupal 8 multilingual to make it work as good as it is, hopefully. So um, I think they did an amazing job. And today, we're going to talk about the APIs to integrate with those since we are at a developer conference. But first, I'd like to make a little introduction around side building stuff. So if somebody is not familiar with how Drupal 8 multilingual is structured, you get an idea. How many of you built a Drupal 7 multilingual site? Yes, you are heroes. You made it work. Yeah, uh, because you may have been here at Jam's opening session. This is a detailed version of those slides that he uh, uses from my slide deck, by the way. So because in Drupal 7, you kind of have Drupal core, which does not really understand language. And then you enable the locale module, which is great because then you can track the list of languages that you have and you can import translations for the interface. But if you have 100 modules and 10 languages, then you need to go through each 100 modules manually and identify the versions of those modules, and then manually go to localize.drupal.org and download their translations for each 10 languages. So you need to manually download 1,000 files to your desktop. And then you need to manually import 1,000 files through a browser. It's very bad. So we built a module called localization update that automates that process identifies the versions, automatically downloads your uh, translations, and when you change versions, it also identifies the new versions. So that's very cool and automates that whole process. So you're probably not going to uh, manage without that module in Drupal 7. And then the only other core module that we have for multilingual in 7 is content translation. And content translation is kind of nice. It allows you to translate nodes. It maintains copies of those nodes. And that's fine. But once you want to translate the taxonomy terms that you've associated with those nodes, or you want to translate the menu items associated with those nodes, there is no solution. Nothing. So you are there, you translated your content, but even the menu items you are unable to translate. And that's very bad. So 
we've built a whole set of other modules to support that. So there's the IATNAN module suite that contains solutions for now translating those menu items and those taxonomy terms and all of those things. And that's kind of nice, but then you also have views. And IATNAN module will not support translating views, so you also install the IATNAN underscore views module, which will integrate with IATNAN and views and do the views localization stuff. And then you also have web forms. But none of these modules will allow you to translate web forms. So you also install the web form localization module, which does not have any naming pattern common with any of the other modules here. You need to find that separately, and then you now can translate web forms. That's great. But then you realize that you are sending these emails to users when they register and when you block them and when they need their new passwords, and there's no way to translate those emails. Okay. So now you install the variable module suite, which is great because then it allows you to integrate with those site settings and then it allows you to translate those emails as well as the site name and site slogan and all kinds of other things. That's great. And then you've add a shopping cart on your site, Drupal Commerce or whatever else. And then nothing of these modules will allow you to translate your shopping cart. So. You also add the entity translation module, so you can translate products and things. And now, you have two ways to translate taxonomy terms, because entity translation will translate your taxonomy terms, and also IATN will translate your taxonomy terms. And now you have two ways to translate nodes, because content translation will translate nodes, and also entity translation will translate nodes. And then you need to pick by content type which one to use, and then it becomes a big confusing mess. So one of the things I helped with at a company recently is they used to use IATNN module to translate their taxonomy terms, so they've had all the translations in IATNN, and then they switched to using NAD translation, and they were trying to fix their, their existing site in IATNN, and it didn't work. And they were like, but I'm fixing the translation that's there. And then we figured out in like half an hour that yes, it's there, but the site is not actually using that data because they now use NAD translation for taxonomy terms. So there's a problem of core not understanding language, and it may be even bigger problem that there are too many solutions for doing things, and they overlap in random ways. So when you try to install these things, then, then they, uh, they become a very confusing mess. And even then, like NDD translation will allow you to translate nodes and taxonomy terms, but they will not allow you to translate the title of a node or a or name of a taxonomy term. So you also need to have the title module to support that. And there's all kinds of other like side sibling modules to these that you need to install. So it easily comes down to like 30 or more modules that you add just to support multilingual. And that's a mess to side build. That's a mess to develop for. Because developers, module developers, would need to understand content translation as a different thing from NAD translation, and they would need to understand IATNN's um, taxonomy translation different from NAD translation's taxonomy translation. Uh, and that's like, why would you do that? Why would you do that to your developers? So contributed modules probably ignore the whole thing because it's just confusing. So all we wanted to do in AID is make it simple for site builders and make it simple for developers and also as much as possible, of course, and then also have an understanding of language deep inside the system. So what we have in 8, anybody started using 8 for multilingual sites already? Or not started, but already using 8 for multilingual sites? Yes? Few of you? Great. A lot of you are not. So like there were like four hens, and then there were like 15 more who are not yet starting to use that, so that's great. So what we have in 8 is we have a module called language. And the language module maintains your list of dynamic, your list of languages that is dynamic is configurable. But even if you don't have language module enabled, Drupal will already maintain language information on everything. So we'll see that a little bit later. But if you want to have actually control over what kind of languages are available on your site, then you need the language module. So this maintains the list of languages. It also decides which language to use for requests for the page. And is maintains languages or lets you maintain language assignments to uh, everything basically from views to taxonomy terms to menu items, menus, etc., all kinds of things. 
And then we have the interface translation as a separate module. And this one is the successor to the locale module. So this provides you interface translation for what's built in the software and also automates all that translation download stuff that we used to have as a separate module in Drupal 7. So interface translation in 8 works automatically when you start installing Drupal. The first screen that you see, the very first screen, is select your language. And it auto detects your language from your browser. And then it downloads translations right away, right there, and starts using that on your site. And then every single module theme you download, update, whatever you do with that install, it's going to download the translations for them and maintain their translations on your site. So it's all automated now. It also has a much better built-in user interface for translation. So if you need to touch up on those translations that it downloads automatically from the community, then it's very easy. It's a two-column translation UI, very easy to use. It has built-in plural formula support and all kinds of other goodies. And this allows you to track customizations to the user interface translation. So we know that there's always arguments about how things should be translated from, with, with the community. And we, you may have customers who want to have different words for stuff. And this module supports natively in core to diverge from the community translations and customize them. And it protects your customizations with all those updates. So the community updates will still work, but not uh, new cure customizations at all. So this has all of those in there. And it also allows you to touch up on English, trans English text. So it allows you to translate English to, uh, uh, to different English. So if you want to say sign in instead of log in or whatever other thing you prefer in English, that's possible too. So it's basically a recognition of English as not being one single language. Uh, that everyone speaks the same way. So that's all built into Drupal core. And then we have a content translation module. And what I've said is a problem in 7 with content translation is only supports nodes. And there's different ways for other things. And in 8, we wanted to have a solution that's as flexible as possible, yet um, supports everything that we want to support. So the 8 content translation module has the same name as the 7 module, but it's entirely different. So the 7 module um, is uh, removed from core. It's not there. And the 8 content translation module is born from the NAD translation system. But this supports translating every single field. So it supports translating the title, the author, the date, the published status, the stickiness, the whatever is on the uh, content item. And it works for every entity type. So it works for user profiles. It works for taxonomy terms. It works for menu items. It works for all kinds of content entities that may happen. And it also works for country content entities like your commerce products and whatever other stuff that people come up with in Contrib. So it works for every content in core and it works for whatever people come up in Contrib. And it's customizable on a per field basis. So you can say, I want to translate the title and the body and whatever the price or what are the image text or whatever on the, on the entity. And you can configure that per field. You can configure all the fields or some of the fields. So it's very easy to set up a range of configuration that you want. You don't need to buy into the model of having copies of your nodes or having per field translation and then not having a way out. This system allows you to configure it however you want and then adjust it later so there's no lock into a specific system. So it's forward compatible with Contrib and also supports all kinds of stuff. And then we have config translation, which works with the built-in configuration system, supports everything in configuration. So it allows you to translate natively in core the site name, the user emails, views, input formats, content types, menus, um, whatever is in configuration, blocks, all of those things. So it natively supports translating everything in the configuration system and is using the same storage mechanism as the configuration system, the same deployment mechanics. So when you use the deployment system with configuration, it totally works with that natively. Very uh, nicely built in there. 
Um, so we have a unified solution for interface translation that's automated. We have a unified solution for content translation and for config translation. If you have a module that you work for your client or on Drupal.org for the community and you maintain data and you don't use the content or configuration system, then we don't have a solution for your translations. If you use the content NED system or the configuration system, then we have a solution for your translations. And it's easy to integrate with. That's what we'll see soon. So you should use the content NED system or the configuration system as much as possible for compatibility with all kinds of stuff. It also gets you all kinds of other goodies like view support and other things. But multilingual support is, uh, I think, key um, for um, your success. So let's see, uh, finally, code examples for language. So the language system, as I've said, maintains your list of language. And there's a service called Language Manager that is globally accessible as Drupal Language Manager. This may not be a best practice, but for the sake of example. So there's a Language Manager service that maintains your list of languages. And it may be two different services based on what you have currently on your Drupal site in core. So by default, it's the language manager provided by the system, which has a built-in fixed list of three languages. And if you enable the language module, then it's replaced by the configurable language manager, which is provided by the language module, and that allows you to configure dynamically the list of languages. But then this service has methods to do all kinds of fancy things. So there's get languages, for example, on the language manager. The built-in language list is these three languages. So in Drupal 7, we've had UND. And people got confused by UND and used it for all kinds of things. So in Drupal 8, we duplicated UND. So you're double confused. Uh, so we separated that to UND, which is used for not specified. So it's useful for things when the thing that you are assigning language to may have a language, but you don't know what the language is. So you don't have information. It's undefined. You don't have information about the language of the thing. And there is now ZXX, which is useful for things where language is not applicable. It does not make sense to assign language. So this allows you to separate the two use cases where you don't know the language, but it may have a language, and it doesn't make sense to have a language. So those two special languages are there. And anybody can define new special languages in modules. Um, that's possible to define, but they are not possible to define on the user interface. And then there is a built-in language for English by default in core, even if you don't have language module enabled. And the Drupal core assumes everything is English. So when you install and you don't have language module enabled, then all the views, menu items, taxonomy terms, in input formats, all of those things will be created as English. And Drupal will know everything one by one that they are English. And later on, it can build on that stuff. If you install the language module, then it allows you to deal with the configurable list of languages. So you can remove English. And then you can add Hungarian and Italian and whatever else you want. Now, English is removable in 8, so you don't need to have English on the side. They are not going to show up in lists of languages. Drupal does not care if you don't have English. It can still operate. And then these languages are stored in the configuration system. So when you export your configuration, then you'll see these um, language.entity.lancode.yaml files. And all these four will have their own files there, and they will be stored in the configuration system, so it's very easy to see them there. And the only difference between these two is the built-in uh, ones are logged. They have a logged property, and the other ones are not logged. It just means that you can delete them, edit them, do whatever you want with them on the user interface. And the locked ones are not possible to remove or delete. The system depends on those two at different places. And then the configurable language manager has uh, some other funky methods, like create from LAN code. Uh, it's very easy to use to create a new language on your site, and that gives you a language object, and you save it. And this creates the configuration object that's saved into your configuration system, and then it's deployable. 
So very easy to uh, work with that API and create new ones. And then you can also just load that language by its line code, by its ID, and then delete it, or do whatever else, change its label or something else. And then once you have a list of languages, the language manager allows you to pick from them. So there's a language negotiation system in 8 that's slightly improved from 7. And the language manager does the language negotiation in get current language, um, which goes through the process that you've configured for language negotiation and picks the right one for the request. So if you want to programmatically use the language that was picked for this request, then you should use get current language on the language manager. So that was language. Interface translation, the good news is there's still the T function. The T function, you use it, it works, uh, gets you a translation, sort of, maybe. The truth is you should forget about the T function, okay? So it's there, it works, sort of, not exactly the same way, but it's practically the same way. But uh, it makes you assume a lot of things about the environment. So calling out to global functions like this assumes that that service is there and that's available and is implemented in a certain way. So what we do instead in Drupal 8 is different. So if you use the global T function, you basically, what happens is you basically have your logic and you call out to these global things like a user or a translation or configuration or whatever. And what we do in Drupal 8 instead is we inject these dependencies and then the injection itself happens to provide you with the right service for the right time. And then you can use the service, the, refer the reference to the service locally. So what we do for T instead is instead of calling global T, we have a translation service injected to our classes and we use this T for um, calling that translation service. So if you use if you build forms based on form base, or if you use blocks based on block base, whatever, then the translation service will already be injected for you in those classes. If you don't use those base classes, then there's string translation trait, which is sort of provides you the same thing. So it, ha it ha defines the T function and form plural and other things to use for translation. So you can do that for your own classes. And then what's actually different in a T function is it's not actually giving you a string. So what happens in Drupal 8 is the T function gets you a, tr a translation object that wraps in there the source string and the options and all kinds of other things. And what happens in Drupal 8 is the translation itself only happens later on when, when, uh, when you need the string translated. So the benefit of that is that we don't translate things that will not end up at the end of the request in the output. So in Drupal 7, there's a lot of building, 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 and there's a lot of altering, 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 that you remove a lot of the building. And we still need to do all the building, right? So here, we just have these objects, and if they are removed later, we don't need to look the, look the translation up in the database or cache them or do whatever else. So it actually turns out to be an optimization. Seems to be erased because it's wrapping strings in objects and passing them around in objects, but it's actually turned out to be an optimization. So you can later on manipulate their options and then create new objects out of them and do all kinds of other fancy things. And format plural is similar. There is not a global function for that anymore, so it's hard to get mistaken there. And there's uh, the method injected with a string translation trait. And the JavaScript API is not really different. It's just T and format plural. There's not much to say there. And then finally, there's these uh, info things that in Drupal 7 used to be info hooks, like hook menu, hook note type info, whatever. And in Drupal 8, these are mostly YAML, fi YAML files, plugin um, YAML files for your information. And they have obviously also translatable strings. So like links.menu.yaml defines your menu links. Um, and they have keys that should contain strings that are translatable. 
So the way we understand the translatability of this one is basically Drupal, the plugin code themselves, the, the plugin codes themselves have understanding of which keys need to be translated and they translate them dynamically in PHP later on. And then on localized.drupal.org, we have the POTX module that understands these files and parses them for translatable strings as well. So you don't need to do anything special for your uh, plugin info.yaml files to uh, inform about translatable keys. Uh, Drupal already understands these. If you write your own plugins and you need your own YAML files for your plugins, then look at the POTX module. It has a format for defining which keys are translatable. So that was interface translation. That still maintains English text to whatever other language. And what's more interesting is content translation, because for content translation, we basically support any content entity type. And content entity types are now defined with annotations on content entity classes. So here is the content entity type for nodes, for example. And the interesting part for you, when you define in your module your content entity types, that you define them as translatable, and then you define the language code key where to store the language code on the entity. So this makes it possible for site administrators to configure nodes to be translatable. So this is an opt-in for translatability configuration. It does not make it automatically always translatable. This allows people to configure nodes to be translatable, okay? And then entity types have base fields, like author, title, all kinds of things that are inherent native to the entity type. Uh, you can also define them to uh, be translatable. So with the base field definitions, you can set translatable true. And this is also opt-in, so people can configure it to be translatable or not. But if you don't opt-in, then they are not configurable to be translatable. And then for all the fields that are configurable on the entity type that are not built in, that are not native, you don't need to do anything special in your code because Drupal maintains the translatability configuration for that and all the data and everything. So there's nothing else to do there. If you have a complicated content uh, entity field type, if you have a complicated field type, like image fields, then it's possible to subdivide your field data to column groups. So for image fields, we have column groups for the image itself and the alt text and the title text. For this example, I've only included the alt text and the file, but there's also the title text. So this allows Drupal to maintain separate file image for a translation and separate alt text for a translation, even though it's in the same field. So in Drupal 8 is also natively supported to sub-configure sub fields uh, for different column groups if the developer defined that in the field type. So if you don't need to subdivide your field, it's all automated, you don't need to care about that. If you have a complex field that needs to be subdivided, you can do that too. And this is also an opt-in suggestion for translatability. So this way, you can define if your entity type is translatable, base field is translatable, and possibly subdivide your fields as well. And then this is exposed in the user interface, so users can configure um, entity types on the bundle slash content type level, and then fields, and then subfields as well. So all of these is, are configurable manually on the user interface. And then once you have your translation, or translatable entity, the content entities are amazing API, I think, because it's very easy to load your content entity. You just say node load 42, and you get a node object, and then it has intelligent methods for doing things. So you can say get translation, whatever, uh, and you get that translation. Or if you want to do the whole language negotiation thing where I want a Hungarian translation, but it may not be available and do fallbacks and all kinds of other things, or just give me the content appropriate for the page, then there's the entity repository service that provides you a get translation from context method that does the whole language negotiation, fallback everything, and gives you the language, a language that exists on the entity and runs through the language negotiation process. So it's very easy to get specific languages or get the language negotiated for whatever on the page. 
And then, as I've said, they are intelligent objects. So you can say, okay, I have this translation, but I actually want to get back the unt untranslated version, or what's the language of this translation that I have now, or what are all the languages that are available on this entity, or does it have a Hungarian translation, or please add a Hungarian translation for me, or please remove the Hungarian translation for me. So content entity is very intelligent objects. You don't need to mess around with these uh, arrays that are three level deep and all kinds of other fun things. You just ask for a translation and it works the same way, same object as the other one that you've asked the translation from. Uh, very transparent, you can pass it around, it's still the same translation. So I think you'll love working with uh, content NED objects in Drupal 8. And you may not even need to work on development for content NEDs, because views is in core, and a lot of things are views. The default front page is a view, the recent users block is a view, the comments block is a view, the node admin page is a view. So you can customize a lot of things without doing custom development. And in views, there's uh, two ways to customize language. So basically, Views is a query builder and a display builder. And language is both supported in the query builder and in the display builder. So we say for the query builder, you can add filters for language and say, I only want to have, in this case, the language, language selected for the page. So the content language selected for the page. This is the default front page, by the way, by default in Drupal core. So then you get content only for the page. And then the rendering language is the display builder setting. And then you can say, give me the language found, content language of Euro. But it's also possible to render the thing you found in a different language. Like look for stuff that was translated to Italian and display in French or whatever, it doesn't matter. So both things you can configure independently. And this is very flexible to use for um, admin forms for blocks for whatever other th uh, purpose that you want to use it for. Like you can clone the node admin page, add the language filter, add the language column, and then use it as a, tra as a translator dashboard uh, because it's very easy to add all those tools and make it uh, work that way. So that's for content entities. So as I've said, it's possible to create content in any language and translate it to any other language. And they are intelligent objects that know their translations and you can ask them about stuff and they work very well uh, for that. Config is quite a bit different animal. So configuration in Drupal 8 is stored in these nice YAML files that are in your active configuration storage, which is by default in the database. So they are installed from your module files like config install system.maintenance.yaml. And the language is stored on each file one by one separately. So we know the language of your maintenance information as English by default when you install it. If you install your site in Italian, then each configuration is uh, going to be stored in Italian. But the default is here is English. So we have the LAN code key as a reserved key on every single configuration file that stores the language information. And this is for maintenance text. And then you, developers, need to define which keys are translatable. Because Drupal doesn't understand that natively. So we have a configuration schema system to define that. And that has all kinds of fun, uh, fancy types for you to work with. So there are nice base types like, uh, like string and mapping. String is just a string, and mapping is an associ associative array. And then we define types based on those base types that are more complex. So for example, we have the config object base type, uh, config object type that is an associative array that defines the LAN code reserved key. So when you have a settings.yaml or some global config file, you would define it as a config object. And then we have types like text, which defines itself as a string that is, by the way, also translatable. So if we put those two together for system.maintenance, then the definition for system.maintenance, the type definition, is system.maintenance is a config object, because it's an associative array that has a line code reserved key on the top. And it has, additionally, a message key that is of type text, because it's a translatable string. So basically, you use the config schema to define 
your config types and basically you inherit from existing types and use that to define the, both the translatability and, all, and the typing of your configuration. So this is used for translation itself. It's used for generating a translation UI for your configuration, which is done automatically. It's pretty cool. You don't need to do anything uh, other than this one to do that. And it is also used for typecasting your configuration. So when you deploy configuration, then it always maintains the same, the same type for all your data. There's no like random type changes in your data. And then the way it stores your translation is, as I've said, the system maintenance that YAML is stored in your active configuration. It has a LAN code EN in my example. And then your active configuration is going to use overrides for translations. So there's going to be a languages that age you that system maintenance YAML, which contains only the message key now in Hungarian. And if you also have an Italian translation, it will have languages that IT, languages slash IT slash system that maintains that YAML, which contains the Italian translation for the message. So this only contains the keys that are translatable and translated. And then when Drupal uses this configuration, it loads the base configuration and it merges the translation on top of the base configuration and then you get the translated configuration out of that. So the way you use that is there's the Drupal config factory and you can ask the config method to give you the system maintenance message and then you can get the message key and work with that. And this will work with your translation. So the config method will apply all the overrides that are available at the time. So the funky thing about configuration is it's not only language overrides that are supported. There's also group specific overrides that you may have heard. There's also global settings overrides. There may be domain overrides. There's all kinds of other overrides that may apply. So what happens in Drupal config is all the overrides are applied and then uh, you get the result. So config is not able to work specifically with language in a way that content does to tell you a list of languages or, tell, or give you specific translations because there's all kinds of other overrides that it needs to work with. If you want to have a specific language, it's very ugly, I'm sorry, but that's how it works. So you need to uh, work with the language manager because the language manager maintains your, what's the language override for your configuration. So what you do here is you get the language manager, get the Hungarian language that you've actually wanted here, and then globally set this state up so you get the previous language override, remember that, set Hungarian as the language override and then do whatever you want and then set back the previous global override state. So this is a lot uglier than it is for content, right? Because content you just get a different language object and you work with that and it's nice. It's not possible in configuration because there's all kinds of other overrides that may apply and there's no special status for language in this sense. So there's a global state to uh, maintain here for that. I'm sorry for that, that's how it is. But then otherwise, you can directly work with uh, configuration. So you get the config system maintenance, then all overrides will apply. If you want no overrides to apply, then you use config factory get editable, which gets you an object that can actually save changes back to your configuration. So this allows you to change your config, un unlike the Config, uh, config one with all the overrides because that one, it has overrides that you don't want to save back to your active configuration. If you want to work with the language override itself, that's maintained by the language manager, as I've said before. So you say, language manager, give me the language override for Hungarian for system maintenance. And then that's an object that you can set the message on and save back to config and stuff. So you can get the stuff, uh, you can get config without overrides, all the, uh, without all the overrides, and you can work specifically with specific overrides. So it's not as nice as content, but it's also a lot more flexible than content because it's possible to have all kinds of variants for config, for domains, groups, users, per environment, whatever. And that's not possible for content. So there's a trade-off of flexibility there. 
So that's for configuration. It's possible to translate from whatever language to whatever language. If you have a site, you can create configuration originally in English, in Italian, and in French, and then translate the English to Italian and the French to Italian, and then the Italian to French and whatever. It's possible to work however you want there. And Drupal natively supports that. And it's more like dump arrays because they are merged together and you cannot really intelligently ask them for translations or other things because they don't know about them. So you need to externally work with the, the language manager to get the right translation and then ask for the object again. And that kind of stuff, it's a bit more cumbersome. So yeah, so these are all the, sub, all the subsystems with all their main APIs. If you want to work on these, then we have a sprint back there on the first floor um, to work on these things. And if you want to discuss this more or have some more time, then I'm also at Du Peloton uh, later on in August. Um, so get there. And finally, I'd like to thank again all of these people because I think they did an amazing job both for site builders and for developers to make it as easy as possible to work with uh, language in Drupal 8. So let's give uh, an applause for them. And that's it for my talk. Any questions? Obviously. And thank you for all the sponsors. Any questions? No, you want lunch now. I can see that. Okay. Yeah. So you so how to handle the context for translation of content? Uh, or what do you mean? Oh yeah, I see. So how to how to do the context information for interface translation, of especially for short strings? We did not change that at, at all in eight. So it's still developer's responsibility to provide the context string for short strings. Uh, we don't have better solutions for that. When you call the this this t method, then it has the same argument list as the global t used to have. So you provided a string and you provided replacements, and then you can provide it with options, which includes the context as well. Okay. So that didn't, uh, didn't change. Um. Yes. Yeah, so the question was, I have two nodes in English, and I add translations for both of them, and now my view displays four items instead of two. Yes, so views in Drupal 8 are based off of node translations, not nodes. So they're going to list you all the translations, and then you can filter for whatever translation you want or whatever set of translations you want. So you can say, this page, I want to show all the Italian and English stuff but not the French stuff. Or this page, I only want to show the language, the stuff that in the language selected for the page dynamically. Or only the language uh, that the default is for the site or whatever. So that's, you should add a filter in your view. So what we do in Drupal core is the front page by default has this filter. And the node admin page does not have any filter because it lists all the translations now. Um, but it has a, has a language selector that you can select the language. So that's, that's how you do it. Yeah, 
so there's two, so views is two things. So views is a query and a display. So the display says that you want to have this header text and you want to have this pager and you want to have all those things. And that's, that's how it's displayed. And the first column is how the query runs. So this one is not going to affect what the result of the query is. The result of the query is on the first column. So here you can say, I want to filter it down to only these languages. And here you say, and I want to render it in this language. So this allows you to like, set these up differently. So you can say, give me the stuff that's not translated to Italian and then render it in English or whatever. So that's possible. So the default setting in the front page is content language for the page and the content language found in the query, basically. <coughs> Both have a lot of options that you can choose from. Oh, one more there. Sorry. Is there anything that didn't make it into Yes. So the question was, is there anything that didn't make it to Drupal 8 that the multilingual initiative has done? Uh, I d so yes and no. So I think the main pain in Drupal 8 now is this, that you have a system for interface translation and a system for content. What we focused on in 8 is to know its language and to make everything translatable in core and in contrib. So have a system that natively supports translation. And once you have that, then, uh, then people can build a UI on top that, uh, that's nice and, and allows you to manage translations better in terms of workflows and approval and third party integration and translation memory and all those things. It's possible to add on, but if there's no native understanding of that language, then it's not possible. So we focused on that layer. And there's already UIs for everything in core, so there's UIs for interface content and config translation. So like you enable config translation and you go to a view and it has a translate tab and you go there and you can translate everything in the view, the displays, the pagers, everything. So everything's possible in core, but there's, it's not, a, not an enterprise grade workflow that's there. But now, Drupal 8 allows us to change and add new features anytime. So we'll, we can add in Drupal 8 new, better user interfaces for translation. So one of the issues is to integrate content translation with in-place editing. So now you can in-place edit a translation that exists, but you cannot create a translation from some offerings. Is the localized server download ready for production? Yeah, so the question was if the client that downloads the translations automatically is production ready? Uh, I believe so, yes. So the client is built into core to the interface translation module and the way we suggest you, so it automatically downloads translation updates. So the way we suggest you to use that is to you do that on your staging or development environments. So you get your translation updates and you get to QA them. And this downloads them to one common directory, all the PO files to one directory. And then you can make it part of your deployment process to push that directory live. And then on your live site, you can configure your live site to only work from the local files and not try to remotely download updates. So your customers will not get surprised by random string translation updates. Um, and you can quality assure that process that way. So I think that's production ready. I personally haven't implemented one like that in production yet, but I believe others did. So that's a way to quality assure all those translations because you, some people don't want to get random translation updates on their live sites from the community but if you want to do that, that's also totally possible. Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming and uh, enjoy the conference and enjoy Drupal 8.